do not compromise my word. You do not let go of my teachings. You do not bend in the face of intimidation. You do not bend in the face of violence. And if you have missed the mark in any way, repent. Repent and I will give you the right to the tree of life. Repent and you will not be harmed by the second death. Repent and your name will be written in the book of life. He tells them simply, you must overcome the world so that you can sit, on, sit with me on my throne as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. And so in chapter 4, John invites us into the throne room of God Almighty where he gives us this depiction of all creation, everything that was creating, filling their ultimate purpose, which is to give praise and glory and honor to God. You have God seated on his majestic throne, surrounded by 24 elders, clothed in their white robes, clothed in their crown. You have four living creatures who are singing praises to God. They're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They're singing, thou art worthy to receive the glory, the honor, and the power because it was by your will that all things were created which quickly brings us to our text and which to me church is the most is the most pivotal is the most poignant it's the most uh, powerful scene in all of revelation revelation has 22 chapters but it climaxes here in chapter 5 it climaxes here in our pericope of text that are behind me and here john says and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Y'all mind if I just teach this real quick? What John is trying to convey to us is so magnificent. It's so impressive. It is so luxurious that when he looks upon God Almighty, he can't even express with words what he is looking at. He, he can tell us what the elders are wearing. He can describe the anatomy of the four living creatures. But when he looks at God Almighty, his vocabulary goes completely bankrupt. He doesn't even dare to describe, does he have a face? Does he have arms? Does he have legs? Church, I am so glad. I'm so glad that the God we serve is so awesome that he is beyond description. He's so awesome that, that, that we can't possibly know everything about him. And I take comfort in knowing that I cannot describe my God. I take comfort in knowing that I cannot fully rationalize my God. Because the moment someone says that they can describe my God, the moment someone says that they can fully rationalize my God, that's the moment that someone could put a limitation on my God. But simply John says, him, or the one that sat on the throne. And then John tells us in his right hand was a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. That goes at number seven again. That number seven, completeness, completeness. What John is trying to tell us is that the will of God Almighty is completely sealed. Understand, in the first century, particularly Roman emperors, when they would pen their final will, the last testament, they would write their instructions, roll it up, melt wax, and seal it with a metal pen. They would write a little bit more, and then seal it with a metal pen. Put it in increments until they were completely sealed. But John not only tells us that, but matter of fact, the person who comes to open it must be a successor. The person who comes to open the will must be worthy enough to view its contents. But not only that, they must be willing to carry out the instructions of the will. But not only that, John tells us it's written on both sides. And see, don't just rush over that. that that's, that's quite rare because the way they made the scroll, they used a the papyrus, they used glue, they used pit, they used water, and they hammered it. But only one side was conducive for writing. Only one side is smooth. So God, why is your will written on the inside and on the back? Why is your will written on both sides? God did not allow any room for anybody to add to his will. And I know that there are those out there in the world who say that they have received an additional revelation of God, but John took care of that. There is no room. I know there are those who say that they have a different revelation of God, but John took care of that. He says, there is no room. <laughs> Matter of fact, John says, if anybody adds to this scroll, God will add to you the place of this book. He says, if anybody takes away words from this scroll, God will take your name out of the Lamb Book of Life. So you don't mess with the will of God.
die. But understand that when you have a will, somebody must die. When you have a will, authority is transferred. When you have a will, an inheritance is ready to be received. And so John says in verse 2, he says, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who was worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. So I can imagine John sitting there in the throne room of God, ready to transcribe what is taking place so he can take it back to his brothers and sisters. But verse 3 says, And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. The Bible says, no one, nobody, not a soul, not in heaven, Gabriel, he's not able. Michael, he's not able. Nobody on earth. There was no religious leader. John couldn't do it. I can't do it. Murray couldn't do it. T.D. Jakes couldn't do it. Joe Osteen, he's not able. And he says there's no one under the earth. No one who has lived and has gone on to Hades. That means Abraham couldn't do it. Moses couldn't do it. David is the breakthrough. There is no philosophical insight that could open that scroll and restore what Adam forfeited in the Garden of Eden. And without the humanity, without the person of Jesus Christ, without his sacrifice, then history in itself becomes an enigma. History has no purpose. It has no hope. It has no future. It has no inheritance. Ask the leper who was able. Ask the man with the withered hand who is able. Ask the woman with the issue of blood who is able. Ask Lazarus who is able. And so, in response to that, check, check John out. John says, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. John begins to weep. Literally, that translates, he's, he's sobbing uncontrollably. Why are you crying, John? Why are you crying, John? Because I'm isolated on the island of Patmos. Why are you crying, John? I'm away from my family. Why are you crying, John? I'm away from all my friends. Why are you crying, John? I've been forced to die a lonely death. Why are you crying, John? Back at home, my brothers and sisters are being bombarded by Roman might. Why are you crying, John? Because back at home, we have to endure Jewish slander. Why are you crying, John? Because I've had brothers and sisters lose their lives. And quite frankly, I need to know where the justice is, God. I need to know, is it worth it? I need to know, are we suffering for no reason? I need to know, what hope do I have? Have you ever been in a situation, church, where your world is so rock that all you have left to cling on is faith? Have you ever been in a situation where you're hurt so bad, whether your spouse betrayed you and it crushes your whole heart? Have you ever been a parent that had to bury their own child and you just don't know which way to turn? Have you ever been to the doctor and they tell you, we don't know how much time you have left? Have you ever been in a situation where you needed an answer from God and you needed it right then? Have you ever been fed up like John? Fed up with the Christian walk because all it did was isolate you from everything you love? Have you ever been in a situation where you just, you just can't seem to find the words to express what you're going through and all you could do is cry? All you have is tears? And see, before we jump on John for having his lack of faith, oh, I applaud that brother. I applaud that brother for his emotions and I applaud that brother for his sincerity because I know everybody in here is hurting at some point. We wake up with that hurt. We get dressed with that hurt. We get in the car with that hurt. We drive to the church building with that hurt. But when we get to that door, we put a mask on. We get to that door, we don't want nobody to know that I'm crushed on the inside. We get to that door, we don't want to let nobody know that I'm doubting right now. We get to that door, we don't want anybody to know that I'm hurt and I need some help. I need to cry, I need a hug, I need some love, I am struggling. So I applaud that, brother. But you see, the beautiful thing about this is what takes place in verse 5. And John says, but one of the elders said to me, 
Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. To open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. This elder or older one speaks up. He sees John crying and says, hush up. Do not cry. Look. Matter of fact, he says, behold. You study that? It means to cast your gaze upon and don't look elsewhere but focus. To look. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed. He has triumphed. He has conquered. You see, John, all he knows is the misery of what he's going through. He knows the misery of being on earth. He is earthly minded. He is so consumed with his situation that he cannot see clearly. While this elder has his robe, he has his crown, he has already overcome the world, so he's speaking from a perspective of heaven. He's heavenly minded, and I want this verse to hit at the heart of every single mature Christian in here. I want this verse to hit at every single seasoned saint in here. Because you have lived, you have struggled, you have had to deal with all the heartbreak and the hurt, and you made it through. And so what you need to do is you need to open your eyes and see that brother sitting next to you that just is so consumed in his situation. Open your eyes and see that sister sitting next to you that just cannot make it. You need to open your eyes and see that brother sitting next to you and crying and let them know, take your eyes off the problem and behold, behold Jesus and let them know that we have a God and we serve a God that is mighty like a lion. We serve a God that is fierce as King David. Matter of fact, it says he's the root of David or mean the source of David's power and let them know that there is no obstacle. There is nothing that you can go through that is too big for Jesus Christ. And so verse 6, this, this got to be my favorite one. Because John says, and I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain. Stood a lamb, as though it had been slain. Now, John is turning. He's expecting to see a fierce lion. He's expecting to see a mighty warrior. But instead, he turns and sees a lamb. But not just a lamb. A lamb looking as if it's been slaughtered or slain. John gives us this depiction of the Passover lamb. This unblemished lamb with his throat cut all the way through. Blood staining its coat, its flesh filleted. Such a weak animal. Such a weak thing is worthy to approach God. Take the will of God. Take the authority from God. Take the inheritance of God. So I ask, what is power, church? What truly is power? And, and the thing that I want you to get from this is that understand that when you are a Christian, if you take nothing from the sermon, get this. If you are a Christian, it means two simple things. That when you live in this world and when you have to walk the steps that Jesus walked, number one, you're going to be vulnerable. You're simply going to be vulnerable. Number two, you're going to have to undoubtedly, inevitably make some sort of sacrifice. If you live in this world and you're a Christian, you will be vulnerable. If you live in this world and you're a Christian, you will undoubtedly make some sort of sacrifice. Understand, church, that if Jesus being perfect was not spared from the abuse of the world, then understand that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you will be subjected to the same things. And as a Christian, that makes you vulnerable. And what I mean by you being vulnerable, it means that you are going to be at times on the account of the testimony of Jesus Christ, you will be open for attack. There are going to be times where you are going to be wounded. There are going to be times where you are going to have to suffer moral attack. There are going to be times where you're going to have to face intimidation. There are times where you have to face criticism. There are going to be times where you have to battle with temptation. But you see, John expresses this vulnerability so well when he calls Jesus a lamb. 
Matter of fact, that's a title he uses for Jesus 28 times in the book of Revelation. That Jesus is this lamb of God. Because John chose the most vulnerable animal he could think of. The most vulnerable animal known at that time because sheep's mere survival is at the mercy of humanity. Sheep depend on humanity for food, for water, for protection. But John actually takes it a step further. When you look at his word for lamb there, it literally translates a little lamb. Or, or, or a baby lamb. And he's saying that Jesus Christ is the lamb who is at the mercy of humanity. Jesus Christ was vulnerable. Jesus Christ was wounded. Jesus Christ was attacked. He was criticized. He was tempted. And ultimately, Jesus Christ gave himself to for sacrifice. But check this. The whole time, he did not retaliate. The whole time, he did not meet force with force. Matter of fact, my brother read last week, it says that he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yeah, he opened out his mouth. And he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as sheep before his shearers are silent, yet he opened not his mouth. And if we listen to the apostle Peter, he tells us exactly how are Christians to respond when the world attacks our vulnerability. First Peter chapter 2, he says, in Christ's suffering for us, he left us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. For when he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Church, understand that you may not be subjected to the abuse of the world in the frame in the form of a Roman crucifixion, but there are going to be times that on the account of the testimony of Jesus Christ, on the account of your faith, that you are going to have to make a sacrifice. There are going to be times where you just might get the short end of the stick. Your boss may not give you the raise you deserve. Your boss may not give you the promotion that you deserve. Kids, sometimes you might not be the coolest person in school. You might not...